What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Yes, Marvel is back on our lives once again with the trilogy capper. I'm going to spoil this movie, but right off the bat, before I do, I want to say I like this movie quite a bit. I think it's a really effective end to a story a lot of people are invested in, a really fitting send-off for a number of characters that have been quite well-received and well-liked for several years now at this point, and even though it's been, you know, a six-year wait since Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, of course, we've seen the Guardians pop up in some Avengers movies and Thor 4 just last year. But this really reminds you of why people like these characters in the first place, why James Gunn is one of the few directors that put their creative stamp on Marvel filmmaking. And I think the absence of the Guardians of the Galaxy moving forward definitely opened up a lot of questions for the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in terms of audience investment, because I think this is an excellent uh, example of paying off audience investment and showing the highs you can achieve with franchise filmmaking when you've you know, kind of done that work and really got people on board with your journey. In a sense, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 feels a lot like a final end note, a capper, end game, if you will, on that you know early era of Marvel. You know, if we think of where we've been at recently, you know, with uh, no no announced plans for the next Thor movie and Chris Evans and Downey long gone now, the Guardians, kind of that next big pillar, you know, obviously Scarlett Johansson's gone, Mark Ruffalo, we assume, is, is, is in the past, Jeremy Renner, like the Guardians of the Galaxy are like the next up to kind of exit stage left, if you will. And will some of these characters come back? I assume some of them will one day. Marvel's never going to stop until they burn to the ground. So we'll probably see someone eventually. But on the other hand, you know, Dave Bautista, Zoe Saldana, they've not really hid the fact that they're looking forward to, happy to uh, leave these characters in their past, even though they've enjoyed their time. So it really feels like the end of something. But it's definitely a really effective trilogy capper. Probably, I mean, easily. This is the best Marvel trilogy there's only a few, right? Um, Captain America has a weak first entry. Iron Man has a weak second entry and a polarizing third entry. I guess the Spider-Man movies in conjunction with Sony come to mind as well, but uh, Spider-Man uh, Far From Home is anything too special to me. So I would probably put the Guardians as like the most succinct creative trilogy within Marvel. And we just saw Marvel trilogies when they go bad this year when Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania came out something that felt like anything but an ant-man movie and more about an mcu storytelling servicing movie you know this is now guardians galaxy 3 is it's largely incredibly self-contained there's no other mcu cameos it's just the guardians extended group and it's great that that's what it is so i quite enjoyed it i would probably say the first guardians is still my favorite but i would put volume three above volume two I don't know if this will be nearly as rewatchable because I think what's pretty interesting about Guardians Galaxy Volume 3 is that it's quite dark, quite melancholic. You know, it's definitely not nearly as kid friendly as uh, certain other Marvel movies, that's for sure. So I don't know how fun certain aspects of this movie will be to revisit, but I think it's definitely a worthwhile effort, and I would endorse it as one of the better MCU films we've got in the past few years, given the up and down nature of Marvel you know, past few years. So I'm going to get into spoilers now. And there's really a lot to get into with this one. It's a lot of fun. Uh, let's see. So, you know, if you think about like what, I don't really have any expectations about like what this is supposed to be, right? Because like the Guardians like pop up in the beginning of Thor Love and Thunder last year. Pretty meaningless appearance. Didn't really make a difference to me. It was more about getting Thor out of their fold than anything else. So from here on out, I was like, all right, let's, remember what happened in volume two and i had to read wikipedia to remind myself it's been a while i haven't rewatched it in a while um adam warlock shows up very quickly will polter's character uh, the post credit scene of volume two and you know i knew about warlock as a comic presence but i didn't really know what to expect about how the mcu would treat him and he's kind of played for laughs kind of played as like a you know this like artificial man who doesn't really understand what's going on so he's just very young and picking up on social dynamics and he's kind of played for humor honestly but the opening like set piece where he goes to nowhere and like fucks up the guardians in pursuit of rocket 
for the villain of the film, the High Evolutionary. Warlock fighting was pretty fun. Will Poulter looks pretty amusing, all golded up, you know, gold gold face paint as well. But like, I guess the payoff with Warlock throughout the film, how he, what happens to him at the end, um, actually feels like it lands in a good place. You know, his uh, quote mother character, the High Sovereign. Elizabeth Debicki's character from Volume Two, small role, doesn't really do much. That's kind of just a, a thank- thankless check for Debicki. Um, but yeah, moving on from that, you know, I think the other big aspect of this, right, would be um, Gamora's back. Different Gamora, though. Remember, Gamora, of course, sacrificed herself in Avengers Endgame. You would have thought that that would have been it, but no. We have the other alternate past timeline, Thanos timeline, Gamora, but it presents itself inter- to interesting storytelling with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 because this Gamora has no relationship with Peter Quill. Certainly is not dating him. So you basically get to have a whole new Gamora, different spin on the performance from Zoe Saldana, and just a whole different dynamic between really the two lead characters of the Guardians. And I think that works to fun effect throughout as um, this Gamora learns what Quill's like and leads itself to some really funny stuff. I love this set piece probably at the end of Act 1, where the Guardians with Gamora in tow go after, I forget the name, the uh, the, the corporation that the High Evolutionary runs to get some uh, uh, code stuff, basically, to help save Rocket's uh, failing health. And there's just a lot of fun set pieces. Nathan Fillion's there as like a security guard chief, and uh, some fun visuals, some fun uh, action set pieces. Everything on that part was really fun. Um, in general, like from that point forward, like it's a really strong Mantis film. Like if you think about Mantis introduced in Volume Two, we've seen it with the rest of the Guardians from here on out. Definitely, Mantis is given the most to do in this movie. Some of the best lines, um, the most like character agency as well. I think Mantis has really come into her own as like a corollary to the Drax character in terms of giving you like this really fun humor and the way they play off each other well. Really enjoy that. Of course, Drax. Dave Bautista just has those line readings down. Hilarious stuff still. Like, the biggest laugh out loud stuff still comes from Drax. And I gotta say, like, the Guardians films, like, still by far the funniest Marvel stuff. You know, like, we talk about the Marvel tone all the time. And we talk about the, when other things don't give us that, right? When we think of, like, the Matthew Reeves Batman, which is so on the other other side of the spectrum in terms of darkness and seriousness, right? But, man, there's really something for, like, just the like matter of fact humor that you get from various characters in the guardians ensemble. And I think it's quite effective once again in this movie. So the high evolutionary, um, new character played by a Chuck Woody, a who's not actor. I was super familiar with on the surface that I remembered he was in peacemaker. There was the James Gunn connection came in. I thought he was really fun as the villain, as this kind of like self obsessed God complex type character who does all this genetic engineering and, trying to make a utopia and make the perfect species, make the perfect world, self-important, really committed performance, really energetic from Wuji. And also it's a personal story. It's not coming from anywhere else in the MCU. It's not Kang the Conqueror getting introduced. No, this is also the guy who fucked up Rocket. The reason Rocket is a sentient raccoon in the first place uh, and getting all that Rocket backstory is really the core crux of the conflict and the emotional core of this film. And I think because the villain is like the direct oppressor to one of the characters we've known and loved since we first saw him in 2014, you know, it really works. And because of this, you know, Rocket's largely sidelined for the majority of the film, but in its place, you get all these flashback scenes and there's like dream, dream state scenes while Rocket's incapacitated, learning about what happened to Rocket and how he got to be uh, fucked up in the head after getting experimented on by High Evolutionary, meeting these other creatures that were, uh, in the same boat as Rocket in the past. One of them, this otter, voiced by Linda Cardellini, funny enough. Um, you know, we, we flash back to that quite a bit. Like It really intersperses us and breaks up scenes in the present. And I think it largely works pretty well. Like You're really invested in Rocket. There's this, you know, the scene at the end where you think maybe Rocket's not going to end up making it at the end. They really make you feel like it's going to happen. And because, again, we have audience investment with these characters, it's like starting to really hit you as an emotional beat. So... I really liked all that Rocket stuff overall, even if a lot of that stuff, you know, that is more of the darker stuff that you don't usually get in MCU. So probably not the funnest stuff to revisit. It's certainly not the most kid-friendly, but 
I think it all works pretty well and pays off well. Um, yeah, just thinking about like speaking of fake outs, like right at the very end, of course, you have uh, the fake out with Peter Quill seemingly sacrificed himself really on Rocket's behalf um, and is starting to die in the vacuum of space. And I was like, wow, wow, they did it. Wow, they managed to factor in a Quill sacrifice and Star Wars off the board. They pull it back. Warlock comes becomes full good, saves him. It's like, okay. I would have really respected them killing off Quill. You know, I guess we're kind of reserving that for only a handful of characters, right? Like, think about the core Marvel characters that have got that, like, true, like, sacrificial death like that. It's been obviously Downey uh, and Sonny Stark, uh, Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson, and technically not, but really Chris Evans as Cap. So, like, the three most famous actors in the MCU got that kind of send off, and really no one else has. You know, I wonder, like, if that was ever on the table. Because, like, even, like, Pratt has seemingly been looking forward to leaving that behind, the way he's leaving Jurassic World behind. And maybe he'll come back one day. I would not be shocked at all. But interesting. You know, I was kind of expecting someone to go, whether it was Dave Bautista or, so he tells it, Saldana. Well, they probably couldn't do that again. You can't kill Gamora twice, right? Like, that just wouldn't feel as impactful a second time. I don't, I'm not sure. I was expecting some kind of character death, but I think the movie still like really wraps up in a nice way that like the fact that none of the main cast dies, actually not a big deal at all. You know, I think everything has a sense of finality without the finality that death brings. So still quite enjoyed it. Um, yeah, man, I think it's, I think it's a fun time. I, I quite enjoyed it. Shout out Maria Bakalova as the voice of Cosmo, the uh, uh, speaking uh, uh, Russian uh, dog, astronaut dog, cosmonaut dog. Um, I just enjoy her her, vo- her voice acting in this. She's pretty fun. Uh, I get Craglin a bit. Sean Gunn. Uh, he's all right. You know, nothing too nothing too fancy. Um, yeah, I think it's you know for Marvel standards, like I said, this is one of the most like creatively engaging, uh, clear through line type movies. Like you really see the vision and you feel the finality. So hats off to uh, James Gunn for fulfilling this vision. Now going off to run. DC. He's definitely done with the MCU now, but I think he definitely left his mark. Um, that's for sure. Yeah, at this point, you know, I'm trying to think, like, what's the next Marvel movie coming up that has a chance to approach anything like this in terms of audience investment and payoff? And, you know, like, no offense to the Marvels coming out at the end of the year. That's our final MCU movie this year, but I don't think there's enough at- uh, attachment to Brie Larson's Captain Marvel and uh, Kamala Khan from the TV show. It's so new. Can't be that one probably has to be next year with Captain America New World Order, uh, you know, because of Sam Wilson. But even then, like, I don't know if people love Sam and love Anthony Mackie the way they love the Guardians, you know. So we'll see. You know, Marvel definitely has their work cut out for them in terms of getting the, the future uh, established in terms of things people really care about, you know. And maybe they're really going to focus on brand new stuff down the line, like the Fantastic Four one day. You know, one day, I mean, we know it's like two years out, like the X-Men one day, you know, and like a lot of these other Marvel MCU players that are already out there maybe aren't going to get that far. We'll see. A uh, lot to think about. Next Marvel thing, actually, is Secret Invasion on Disney+, Plus, the first series of the year, which I think actually looks pretty good. Marvel clearly has been pairing back, only releasing one TV show in the first half of the year, a big change from the past two years. So we'll see if the MCU fatigue starts to walk back notably Guardians of the Galaxy volume three is looking at a softer box office opening than volume two I think it's very interesting to think about that um worldwide opening I'd expect to be flat or even below but big part of that is the China gross is going to be a fraction of what happened in 2017 for many reasons not all on Marvel but Marvel's performance domestically you know a lot of that we have to kind of lay at MCU's feet you know Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania really tanking paling in comparison to Ant-Man 2 box office so I wonder if some of Ant-Man's sins and that malaise with Marvel is going to be applied to volume 3 and of course when I'm talking about like general audiences which take the numbers over the top obviously the fans and the faithful will be there regardless but I'll be curious to see what the legs are with volume 3 more than anything else because in two weeks you get Fast 10 coming out and the summer's pretty stacked so we'll see what happens there but uh, for more movie reviews more Marvel subscribe And I'll see you next time.